Um, so just quickly, a little bit of a, a background about me uh, and, and the company. Um, as Stephen mentioned, I'm one of the co-founders of Instacosta. Uh, the company's been around for, I'm forgetting how, how long it is actually, it's like six or seven years, something like that. Um, and uh, we're, we're kind of in the, the kind of uh, managed Cassandra, managed Kafka, managed Elasticsearch uh, space. Uh, we do that on the cloud uh, and on-prem. Um, Apache Cassandra is kind of our bread and butter. We've been doing that for the longest. Uh, we started with Cassandra, um, and that's that's really my main focus is Cassandra and our various open source projects that, that surround it, and hence this presentation, right? Um, in terms of the managed platform, as I said, it's, it's cloud and on-prem, uh, and we support all the major cloud providers, so AWS, Azure and Google, of course, uh, and an IBM's offering as well. Uh, and in terms of scale, uh, you know, we, we kind of have um, nearly uh, 4,000 nodes under management of, of all the various technologies, and that's both cloud and on-prem. And we offer uh, full 24 by 7, 365 support with, with the offering, right? So there's always somebody you can reach out to if you have problems with your Cassandra cluster, um, regardless of if that's a uh, a cloud managed or if it's an on-prem uh, cluster as well. We also do consulting services for all these technologies. Um, and so that's actually uh, sort of what I've been doing for the last couple of years. I actually relocated from, from Canberra, uh, my hometown, all the way over to San Jose in California uh, to help out with our American sales and consulting group over there um, to uh, essentially not only do consulting, but also run workshops and, and help out with, with uh, kind of technical questions we have in, in sales meetings and things like that as well. Um, but now that I've moved back to uh, Canberra, it's, it's been, it was a nice three years over in the States, but I've moved back home. Uh, and so now my main focus is again, back onto Cassandra and our various open source projects surrounding that and kind of building up the ecosystem a little bit there. So essentially that's what this presentation is, is all about. So uh, enough about me and, and the company and all the sales pitchy stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll jump straight into it now. Is this a couple of chat messages here? Okay, nothing. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Very, very rude. And just make sure that, that we click the record button. Absolutely, yes. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's recording at Excellent. this time. So we, we should be good. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you. Excellent. All right, so uh, essentially the, the agenda for this evening's talk is, is to kind of go through a bunch of our various tools in you know, fairly, uh, you know, uh, in, in detail. Uh, and so we're gonna start with our enterprise grade authentication plugins for Cassandra. So that's both an LDAP and Kerberos uh, plugin that, that exists to, um, you know, well, essentially integrate with those technologies. Uh, we also have a bunch of low-level diagnostics utilities that are good for, um, uh, you know, if you have problems with your data model and things like that, we can we can use these uh, to sort of, you know, find the, the root cause of the problems. Uh, we've also got our own uh, backup and restore utility, which we use as part of the managed service as well as, uh, you know, for on-prem customers, things like that. Uh, we've also been working on kind of like a sidecar component, which kind of goes hand in hand with that backup and restore stuff as well. And then we've been doing quite a bit of work around monitoring and alerting as well. So that's essentially what we're going to cover this evening. So getting stuck right into it, uh, enterprise grade authentication. Um, so as I said, it's, it's uh, Kerberos plugin, an LDAP plugin for Cassandra, and essentially this gives you, um, you know, centralized management of your uh, users and the credentials for those users, i.e. what you use to authenticate against Cassandra. Um, it essentially gives you application level single sign-on if it's all set up correctly. Uh, and, you know, you can do things like have multiple clusters share the same authentication credentials. Um, it simplifies the management of your credentials, you know, because it's all centralized, so you can, you can rotate them, uh, you can deploy new ones, you can revoke old ones or ones that, are, I don't know, hopefully you don't have a, a security breach or whatever, but if, if something gets leaked, you know, you could uh, do uh, credential revocation as well. Uh, and 
while this kind of stuff is available in some of the commercial distributions of Cassandra, these tools that we've released are available to users of the open source version of Apache Cassandra. Uh, they are open source themselves as plugins, so you know you can go and fetch the code off GitHub and, and see how they work as well. So you know you can make sure that they're doing exactly what you expect. Um, so essentially, how these work, right, is uh, so some just basics on how Cassandra Auth works is it's the, the CQL binary protocol, which is what your client applications uh, use to communicate with the nodes in the Cassandra cluster. That supports uh, simple authentication and security layer uh, or SASL authentication. Uh, so it's kind of like this, you know, extensible, pluggable authentication mechanism, um, uh, you know, that, that can be implemented uh, as long as you've got a client side plugin and a server side plugin to support it, then uh, you know you, you can essentially implement your own uh, authentication system. So essentially, uh, you know, we leverage this to implement the um, Kerberos and LDAP support uh, via plugins for both the server and for the client. Uh, now, of course, as we all know, Cassandra supports, you know, basic username and password uh, authentication out of the box. Um, but these aren't really centralized or anything like that. They're all stored in a uh, system auth key space on the cluster itself. And there's a little bit of you know, management that has to happen to make sure that things like you know, the, the replication factor of, of that key space and everything's all set up and correct as well. But it's, it's kind of per cluster. So if you've got multiple clusters and you want to sync credentials, you just have to do it in a fairly manual way. Whereas uh, you know, leveraging LDAP, means you can stick them all in a, in a central directory and um, remove that, that manual step. Uh, so the Kerberos Authenticator uh, essentially gives you um, single sign-on support for CQL. Um, and this is implemented both as a server and client uh, extension because it, it's, it's not just usernames and passwords anymore, it's, it's tickets and tokens. And uh, I, I'm not a super expert on Kerberos here, but um, you know, it, it's, it's essentially, it, it, it leverages Java's um, uh, kind of built-in mechanisms to integrate with Kerberos. So that's the uh, Java Authentication and Authorization Service, JAS, uh, and combines that with the, the standard GSS API SASL stuff to implement Kerberos support. And, and this is done both on the client and on the server. Um, it has a bunch of nice features such as uh, transit protection. So the, the, the actual authentication is done over an encrypted channel uh, and it's got uh, quality of protection adjustable stuff as well, which is a, a Kerberos specific feature. Um, as I mentioned, this plugin, it is uh, open source compared to say, for example, the, the one that's included with Datastax Enterprise. Uh, and we have builds available for various versions of Cassandra, um, both at this, at this time, the 3.0 series and the more commonly used uh, 3.11 series as well. And of course, once version four uh, sort of gets around to being released, we'll also have a version of this plugin available for version four as well. We're actually working on it at the moment, um, but because V4 is not really released yet, it's still in, in, uh, in, in beta. It's, um, uh, we, we haven't really released the plugin as a uh, you know production ready thing at this moment. One thing to note is that the the client extension, uh, you know, of course, Cassandra has um, drivers available for numerous languages, uh, not just Java. Uh, but at this time, this Kerberos plugin, because it leverages JAS. Uh, to kind of integrate all, do all the Kerberos stuff on the client, uh, it is Java only. So, um, you know, at, at this time, if, if we wanted to do other languages, a client plugin would have to be written for those languages. Um, there are some prerequisites to actually getting this thing working, um, which is perhaps a little bit more stringent than what you need for just plain old vanilla Cassandra, but a lot of these are more kind of standard Kerberos requirements. Uh, you need to have unique DNS available for every uh, every node in the cluster. So everybody needs to have a host name that's registered on a DNS server and reverse DNS needs to work as well. Uh, of course, you need a KDC server running, the key distribution center, uh, and then also all the, the Kerberos client libraries and things like that also need to be installed on the nodes themselves. Uh, NTP needs to be configured, which 
I hope you already have it configured. If you're running Cassandra, uh, synchronized clocks are very important in Cassandra's world as well. Uh, but of course, Kerberos uses synchronized clocks uh, or requires synchronized clocks, sorry, to, to kind of do various validations on things. So if your clocks are out of sync, stuff doesn't work. Uh, and then depending on which JVM you're using, uh, you may or may not have the uh, Java cryptography extensions unlimited strength policy stuff already installed. So you may have to go and fetch that off the internet as well. Um, and then you of course need all the uh, the Kerberos uh, key tabs and service principles installed, which is fairly general Kerberos setup there. So for the uh, for the nodes themselves, what, what you do is um, uh, ensure that the RPC address and the broadcast RPC address in, in Cassandra's YAML uh, which are, of course, the nodes IPs, are uh, they're addressable from other nodes in the cluster and from clients and things, but also resolvable uh, through DNS and that reverse DNS works. Uh, and then you need to configure a Kerberos on each node uh, with the Kerberos Realm and KDC details, and you create a new Kerberos service principle for each node. So you use kadmin to do that for each node in the cluster. Uh, you then create a key tab for each node in the cluster using that service principle, and then you copy the corresponding files onto each nodes, uh, um, you know, into the Cassandra configuration directory. Um, and that's kind of the Kerberos setup stuff done. And then you download the plugin and place that into Cassandra's class path, which is, uh, you know, under the, the, the lib directory. Depending if you've done a package install or a tarball install, that location will be a little bit different, of course. Uh, and then you, you modify Cassandra YAML to set the authenticator option to use InstaCluster's Kerberos authenticator plugin. So you specify the class name there. And then lastly, there's a, uh, a properties file that you need to create, which essentially configures the plugin and tells it, you know, what service principle to use, what key tab file to use, and various other Kerberos settings that need to be provided as well. So that's everything from the, the, node setup side, of course, I'd recommend doing all this sort of thing via uh, some kind of configuration management uh, option, you know, Ansible or Chef or Puppet or, or something like that, uh, to make sure that this is done uh, in a uh, repeatable and um, consistent manner across all the nodes. Um, because if it's not configured on some nodes, you get weird problems where, you know, authentication seems to work sometimes, but not all the time, weird things like that. So making sure you have consistent configuration is, is very important. Uh, and that, that goes for general configuration, as, of course, as well, not just for this plugin. On the client side, uh, things are a little bit easier. Uh, of course, you need to have synchronized clocks there as well to so make sure your client nodes have NTP uh, configured and active. And ideally, they're using the same NTP server as the Cassandra nodes and the KDC to avoid any kind of clock slew at all. Uh, then you you know, for your application, your driver application, add the Cassandra driver Kerberos, um, uh, what do you call it, artifact as a dependency in your uh, Maven POM or, you know, what other build system you're using, uh, you'll be able to specify the coordinates there as well. Uh, and then essentially you configure the Java driver to use the Kerberos auth provider. So there's, there's various ways depending on how you initialize the session. Uh, this is for the, the version three driver. For version four, it's, it's slightly different, but essentially there's a builder option that you can specify a auth provider. And usually it's the username and password one, but here we can actually specify the Kerberos auth provider instead. Uh, and yeah, once you call build, the that session will start using Kerberos instead of usernames and passwords. Um, lastly, uh, you configure uh, Java authentication and authorization services or JAS. Uh, you create a JAS conf file in your application's configuration directory or at least somewhere that's sort of accessible. Uh, and then you launch uh, your application and specify the Java security auth login config property, which specifies the path to that JAS file. And um, essentially that will then uh, use Kerberos uh, over um, the CQL protocol to authenticate against your nodes. Now, um, in terms of, you know, that, that's a fairly, uh, 
brief crash course on, on how to install and set this up, uh, there is far more detailed documentation available on the two project pages. Uh, so there's the Java driver and, oh, sorry, I just realized that those links are both the same. Uh, the, the first URL is supposed to point to the, the uh, authenticator plugin, my mistake there. Um, but it's, yeah, essentially there's, there's two projects, actually the, the second one links to the other one, so you'll be able to find it. Or of course, if you just browse on, on our GitHub account and search for Kerberos, you'll find it as well. Um, there's the, the readme included with the projects, uh, kind of gives you a whole bunch of um, detail on how to uh, configure and set these things up in uh, more than I've gone through here. And we also have a blog post that goes into some more detail as well. So I encourage you to check those out. So complementary to the Kerberos plugin is the LDAP authenticator. Um, so this allows you to uh, verify usernames and passwords against a central LDAP server or uh, you know, more commonly Active Directory, uh, which gives you centralized user management. Um, this plugin, uh, we have a little bit more broad support. It, it also supports Cassandra 2.2. We had a couple of customers that needed it, so we kind of backported it to earlier versions. Uh, but same thing, it supports latest version of Cassandra, plus, of course, when version 4 becomes a thing, uh, we'll be supporting that as well. Um, one thing to note is that this, this does leverage the, the kind of more normal username and password uh, authentication uh, mechanism of the CQL protocol. And so by default, uh, those credentials are sent in plain text over the wire to Cassandra. So highly recommend you enable client node uh, TLS encryption. Um, and then the other thing to note is that credentials are cached uh, for a period of time. That time is configurable, but essentially that's to prevent uh, overloading the LDAP server because essentially Cassandra frequently queries uh, or, or calls out to the active authenticator plugin uh, to you know, validate credentials or um, roles and, and all that sort of thing. And so if there was no case involved, it would potentially over, uh, overload your LDAP server, which you don't want to do. Uh, so there is a thing to note there, of course, if you, if you change credentials or revoke credentials, uh, there is a period of time where uh, there, there may be some some of that information is still cached on, on each of the nodes of, of Cassandra. Uh, because this is simply just a server-side plugin, there's no uh, client-side component. So it does work with every driver on for every language. Um, you know, the, the installation is a little bit simpler because you only have to do it on the servers themselves. And it's basically download the authenticator jar off our GitHub page and put it into Cassandra's lib directory, i.e. on the class path. Uh, and then also copy the LDAP properties file also from the Git repository uh, into the ETC Cassandra directory and modify various things as appropriate, such as the LDAP server address, uh, the you know naming attribute if you're not using say CN as standard, uh, you know the the various login credentials to actually access the LDAP server, things like that. Um, then you update cassandra.yaml uh, and set the authenticator and role manager parameters to the various classes. Um, you leave the authorizer as Cassandra authorizer and there is the settings in the Cassandra YAML file as well for the various uh, cache parameters for those credentials. And like I said, there's nothing that you need to change on the client side. Uh, so uh, you can just continue to use the plain text auth provider component uh, that's, that's standard with the driver. So where to get it? Uh, off our GitHub account, uh, instacluster slash Cassandra dash LDAP. There's also a introductory blog post um, uh, available up on our website. The link is there. Um, and rather than people having to, oh, actually I see Eric is uh, copying these links into the chat window. Thanks very much for that, mate. Um, there will be a copy of this, this presentation slide deck available for everybody after as well. So uh, these links will be clickable in the PDF version. So the next project I wanted to look at is uh, the one that we've uh, called Cassandra SS Table Tools. It's very creative and a <laughs> good name for it. Essentially it's a collection of utilities uh, to do offline analysis of um, uh, Cassandra's uh, SS tables. 
Um, actually, yeah. just before I, I dig into this, I see that there's a question here in the chat, um, which is with both uh, Kerberos and LBAP auth add-ons, is it still possible to use standard authentication mechanisms as well? Uh, as in, you mean, are you able to use um, plain text as well as Kerberos at the same time? Uh, I don't believe so. I, I, my understanding is it kind of it's, it's one or the other, um, but I'm not 100% certain on that. Um, if you reach out to me via email, if you, if you are very interested in that question, I can attempt to, to do a little bit of research and find that out. But I, I believe it's, it's one or the other. Um, you know, essentially there's a, uh, a class that you specify both on the server and on the client. Uh, to kind of which authentication mechanism you want to use, and, and they don't stack or anything like that. Uh, what happens if the Kerberos server is unreachable? Uh, well, you have problems with your authentication is what I believe happens. I, as I said, I'm not a super expert in Kerberos myself, uh, so I don't know if there is some kind of option to do, uh, you know, caching of tickets locally for a period of time. Uh, or if um, you know there's some way to do HA Kerberos, I kind of hope there is uh, because you know it seems like a you know you end up with a kind of central point of failure. Um, but yeah, good questions. Yeah, there you go. Eric mentioned that. Um, that yeah, it, it, essentially, yeah. If you can't get a valid ticket from the the uh, KDC, then you won't be able to authenticate. Um, okay, so back to SS table tools. Um, yeah, so as I said, it's a, it's a set of utilities that we've written uh, to do offline analysis of Cassandra's uh, raw data files, the SS table files on disk. Um, and essentially they provide, you know, detailed uh, metadata, you know, accurate statistics, things like that, um, that are, you know, they're slower to generate, but better to do kind of those low level, um, kind of kind of problem solving things because essentially sometimes the the output that uh, no tool can provide or if you fetch it via JMX or something all the live statistics and, and estimates that are uh, Cassandra's calculating at runtime they could actually be wrong uh, sometimes you know depending on how long the cost has been running for and things like that um, and the other thing is that sometimes Cassandra just doesn't have statistics or, or, you know, good estimates for something that you're after. And so, you know, essentially we're able to provide more information here because it is a, uh, an offline analysis of, of the data files. Um, so it's very useful for, you know, doing things like optimizing your data model and, and tuning various compaction strategy settings and things like that. So you can actually see how things are working under the hood. Um, and so I have a little bit of an anecdote here, which is, uh, you know, we recently had a support customer who was uh, running uh, Spark jobs uh, against Cassandra and they were failing all the time. Uh, and that they had no way of knowing which query, uh, you know, it was failing on. Um, and they also reckoned that their data model wasn't an issue. So we got to them to run these utilities and, and kind of to one of the tools to list the, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, partition leaders um, and we could actually see that they had large partitions and, um, you know, we were then able to craft a, a query by hand against that table uh, that would, would target the large partition and essentially that then crashed the node and we were able to prove that their data model actually was uh, problematic, um, you know, because uh, the the <laughs> the, the query was it was able to to show that right. So these utilities were uh, you know quite useful in that case to actually see uh, you know exactly which partition was the problem. We were then able to craft the query that that targets that and and show without a doubt that there is actually a problem with the data model. So we use these all the time internally as part of our tech ops uh, group um, for supporting the managed service, and also you know we run them quite often uh, when doing consulting. Uh, things for for customers who have on-prem clusters and things like that. Um, in terms of the actual utilities that are included inside the the package, uh, there is IC summary, which gives you sort of fairly high-level summary information. 
there's ICSS tables, which prints out various uh, metadata about SS tables for a specific table that you, uh, so that's a CQL table. Uh, there's P stats, which gives partition statistics. There's CF stats, which gives you uh, various cell level information uh, on, on a table. And there is um, purge, which gives you details about reclaimable data, i.e. stuff that could be potentially compacted away. Uh, so IC summary and ICSS tables, um, you know, the, the first one, IC summary is useful for finding the largest tables in your cluster and how much data has been repaired using incremental repairs. Um, you know, repairs are something that we see problems with all the time, either people not running them or having problems with running them and sort of trying to get a little bit of a, an understanding about how well repairs are working. Uh, you know, can be useful. And so IC summary provides that kind of information. Um, and then ICSS tables prints out various bits of metadata about a table, and it's essentially useful for helping tuning various compaction strategy settings. So, you know, there's things to do with, uh, you know, the, the size of the data, both compressed and uncompressed, various timestamps uh, for both uh, the, the cell liveness and tombstones, partition key counts, average partition sizes, you know, average and maximum counts of uh, columns per partition and so on and so forth. There's, there's quite a wealth of information there. Uh, PSTATS um, has uh, various amounts of output as well, um, but again, it's it's useful for finding the largest partitions and the various um, SS table leaders, which, which includes the offending uh, partition key, as I said, so we were able to use this tool to kind of reverse engineer the query that was causing a cluster to have outages. Um, and then lastly, CF stats, uh, you know, is, is kind of very low level uh, for, for detailed cell statistics and things like that. So um, that's for very low level data modeling adjustments and problems. Uh, some of the output, like largest partitions, widest partitions, and so on, um, you know, they also include the offending partition key for that particular uh, statistic. So again, that's how you can discover, you know, if you actually want to go digging about uh, into the, the information itself, into the data, you can actually uh, at least find out which partition it's stored in and, and do a little bit more debugging, uh, both from your application side, see what's inserting onto that partition or updating that partition, or uh, you know, kind of just having a look to see what kind of data is in there in the first place. Um, one thing to mention uh, is that CF stats is um, very, very, very slow uh, because it essentially goes through and reads every SS table on disk um, and analyzes the contents. But the result is that the output is extremely accurate, right? So it's not the first thing that we'd recommend running, um, you know, kind of use the other tools uh, first to kind of narrow down the various, uh, you know, kind of problems, spots, right? But then once uh, you kind of have identified where the problems may lie, you know, run CF stats over a set of um, SS tables and see if it can generate uh, some useful information for you. Um, you know, so an example there is that uh, no tool CF stats, you know, it gives you average and, and maximum partition sizes, um, but they're estimates and they're sometimes way off depending on the version of Cassandra. Um, whereas this tool will give you exact numbers and which SS table file it's actually in and what the partition key is. No tool and Cassandra's internal statistics and things just doesn't have the, that level of information because it's not doing that slow uh, offline analysis of the data um, to actually determine, you know, to be able to provide any of that sort of uh, kind of debugging information. Um, so, you know, you can't use Node Tool, for example, to reconstruct a query uh, to kind of determine where the problems may lie. So very handy, it's very low level, uh, but very, very useful. And, and as Eric mentioned here is, um, uh, you know, it, it gets brought up on the uh, Apache, uh, foundations uh, Slack channel sometimes, um, you know, when people need to do data modeling, diagnostics, and stuff like that. So it is in use by the community as well as us internally as well. So it's it's open source. It's up on our GitHub account. Uh, here's the link here: InstaCluster/Cassandra/SS Table Tools. 
Uh, it has a readme that goes into a lot more information than I have uh, provided here, you know, the kind of crash course in, into the various things. Um, you know, so I encourage you to, you know, check it out if you need to do some low level uh, debugging of your data model and things like that. So uh, next thing I wanted to talk about was backups and um, restoring from backups. Um, you know, this is kind of one of those interesting topics because, you know, we, we bring it up sometimes to people running Cassandra on-prem and, you know, they always go, well, why do you need backups, right? <laughs> I thought Cassandra is supposed to be this, you know, redundant, highly available uh, data store, you know, backups, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's built in, right? And and while you can say, well, sure, you know, it's got all those features, um, you know, that, that provides day-to-day -day guarantees for application stability and application availability, things like that, uh, you know, and, and various failure scenarios are protected against, um, you know, a single node outage, which would typically be something where you would need to restore from backup in maybe a more traditional database system, you don't need to in Cassandra because it will restream the data from other replicas, all great. Um, but this, uh, sort of built-in redundancy uh, and, and replication of data does not protect against a certain class of problems, and that is data corruption or deletion, um, uh, you know, operator error or even uh, deliberate malicious action. You know, so somebody runs deletes uh, on on a whole bunch of data in a table they didn't mean to do that. Well, Cassandra's uh, replication will replicate those deletes and, and the data is essentially uh, gone. Uh, if you truncate a table, same thing. If you drop a table, um, you know, there, there, there has been bugs uh, in Cassandra in the past which cause um, data corruption. Uh, you know, so having backups of, of your information is, is useful in that case. And again, yeah, you know, if there's uh, Security breaches where people go in and modify data, you know, the only way to, to recover from that is to actually have a secondary source, i.e. your backups. Um, so sort of built into Cassandra, there is a whole bunch of stuff that you can leverage uh, that, that, you know, to, to kind of build your backup foundation on, I suppose you could say. Um, you have snapshots, uh, i.e. what you get when you run no tool snapshot. Uh, and essentially all that's doing is hard linking the various SS table files, you know, so the, the raw data files themselves into a snapshot directory. And because it's hard links, even if Cassandra goes and deletes uh, SS table files, you know, once they get compacted away or something like that, the, the hard link won't remove all traces of that information off the disk until you delete the snapshot directory as well. Um, just a little bit of a refresher, of course, is that Cassandra's SS table files are immutable. So once Cassandra has written one to disk, it really doesn't go back and make any modifications to that. So hard links are fine in this case because you're only ever caring about, uh, you know, preventing against deletion of old SS table files on off, off disk. Um, snapshots are essentially usually triggered via a administrator or an operator. Um, they can happen automatically if you do things like truncate as a little bit of a protection against, you know, people doing the wrong thing. Um, but, you know, typically you also run them as a scheduled operation. So, you know, on a periodic basis, you take a snapshot. Um, the granularity of these is tunable. So you can do it all the way from the key space or the whole node down to, uh, you know, a single key space um, or even right down to a single table if you want to. Um, in addition to snapshots, there's also incremental backups and commit log archiving, which are kind of two additional things that you can leverage uh, to provide a kind of finer, um, uh, you know, kind of, uh, what do you call it? Um, you know, kind of time frame or uh, what is it, RPO or is it? RTO, I always get those two things confused, but essentially by, you know, snapshots are the fairly, uh, you know, coarse grain thing. Uh, you know, you take them on a, you know, on a periodic basis and then incremental backups and commit log archiving as they occur as data gets written to the node. So as you see here, uh, incremental backups occur as, as soon as a new SS table is uh, written to disk, 
a hard link is written into a backup directory. So that's on every mem table flush. Um, and then commit log archiving is even before mem tables get flushed, it's, it's the actual commit log segments themselves can be archived into a directory as well to uh, you know keep a copy. So then what you do is you keep snapshots and either incremental backups or commit log archiving, and you can replay a combination of both to get to a uh, you know more fine grained restore point uh, in time. So of course some basics with backups. So here we go. We've got RPO and RTO, right? Uh, is is essentially you know you need to define these various things first. So you know sit down and actually work out you know how much data are you willing to potentially lose? Uh, you know is it that you could lose an hour's worth of data and you'll be fine, a day's worth of data, or does it need to be literally you know down to the you know minute kind of interval? Um, but that's kind of a fairly, you know, common thing, you know, it doesn't just apply to Cassandra, it's sort of, you know, for any backup system, you need to kind of work out what your RPO and RTO times are going to be. Um, but then more specific to Cassandra, uh, one thing that, you know, we've actually seen people forget in the past is, um, you, it's not just copying the SS tables, it's actually making a backup of a few other things as well. So you need to make sure that you um, keep a copy of the tokens that are assigned to each node. Uh, this is very important if you want to be able to restore to a uh, identical topology cluster, um, which is far faster than streaming all the SS tables from a snapshot into a new cluster. You can essentially just copy the data files back onto each node, make sure the tokens on each node are the same, uh, and then start Cassandra, and, and it will see it as if nothing ever happened, right? It's just as if the it's been switched off for a, for a period of time. Um, the other thing to to keep in mind is also to keep a copy of the schema, uh, you know, and there might be, you know, various things here where maybe your application already has a copy of it, you know, checked into source control or something. But honestly, it's it's so small, uh, you know, it's just a little bit of text data. Um, you know, you might as well keep a copy of the schema along with each snapshot or each backup so that you know you you know what the schema was at the time when the backup was created not what the kind of current version in source control is or maybe that's out of date maybe someone's created a table without uh you know checking it into source control all these things kind of happen um so having a backup copy of the schema is very important um and then lastly you know use a combination of cassandra's backup features so snapshots incremental backups and commit log archiving to reach your RPO and RTO objectives. Um, some challenges with backups is, uh, you know, the, the backup process can can be fairly disk and network IO intensive, um, you know, depending on how frequently you snapshot and also how much data uh, you, you write or uh, mutate on the cluster. There might be a lot of uh, differences between SS tables between snapshots and so there will be potentially a large amount of information to copy off node um, and depending on your uh, kind of you know networking setup and things you know you might be sharing the same NIC uh, for both kind of Cassandra's you know into node communications communications with your application as maybe communications to your off node storage location and so they're all going to be competing for network IO and of course because you're copying from the data directory you're going to be competing for disk IO on uh, the, the the node itself. So one of the things uh, that we would recommend is, is having the ability to throttle um, your backups so that you know you don't try and copy things off node as, as fast as possible you should do it as a, a little bit more of a trickle in the background um, and you know, that will then mean that you're not going to affect uh, the kind of cluster performance as much. There's going to be a little bit of an impact, of course. The other thing is, uh, if you just back up snapshots in a kind of naive manner, so, you know, just every time you've got a snapshot, you just copy the whole directory uh, off to remote storage, it can start to get expensive because you're essentially making a full copy of the data directory every time. Uh, there's ways to optimize this, but, you know, it can be kind of complex already by itself. Um, and so that's where some of the tooling comes in, which I'll talk about in, in a minute. <clears throat> um, and then on the restore side, as I mentioned, you know, if you don't have a copy of the uh, token ranges, you can't do fast restores anyway. But 
even if you do have a copy of the token ranges, you can only do that uh, to you know an identical topology. So if you had a nine node cluster and you want to restore to a new cluster, it also has to be nine nodes. You can't do to a larger or smaller, uh, you know, unless you go down the SS table loader route, which is a lot slower. Um, you know, so that's something to keep in mind because of course people often use backups as a way to transfer, uh, you know, like a, a production uh, data sets, you know, over onto a test environment or something like that. But, you know, your production environment might be larger in size than your test environment. Um, you know, if you want to do a fast restore to test, you need to have that identical topology. So there's a little bit of trade-off to think about there as well. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, you know, you can optimize snapshot storage a little bit uh, by leveraging a few, uh, you know, kind of inherent uh, features about Cassandra's storage uh, mechanisms. So, as I mentioned, SS tables are immutable, so they only ever get created or deleted, not modified. Um, so, once you've kind of copied an SS table off node to a remote location, if you see that same file again in the new snapshot, you don't need to copy it. You can essentially replicate the hard link on the other end or uh, you know manifests or something there's various ways to approach it but you know only copy new ss tables not the whole thing each time um so you know to kind of give you a visual example here what what happens right is you know imagine over time uh the amount of data on a node grows and uh you know ss tables get compacted away and uh new ones get created and so on and so forth and so over time the set of SS tables or live SS tables changes. So snapshot one contains a single SS table, A. Then sometime later, snapshot two is created and it now contains A and B. Well, in this case, you don't need to upload A again because those two files are identical. They are exactly the same thing. Um, the same situation occurs for snapshot three where, okay, A has now been deleted, you know, something's come along and compacted it together and a, a new file has been written out, C in this case, but B is the same across snapshot two and three and, and four as well. So you can see that there's kind of those, those lines of common files. And when you have that, there is no need to copy the whole thing off node every time. Um, yeah, and, and this is something we, we see happen uh, quite often is, is people running, uh, you know, uh, on prem and their their backup solution is to literally call no tool snapshot and then you know scp or rsync or even weirdly things like uh you know tar the whole thing up to another disk locally then copy that off node which is just kind of like doubling the io workload for for no reason um but you know they make a full copy of the data directory every time now you could argue that the advantages of this is that it's uh it's a lot easier to restore because you've essentially got you know there's a a set of files that you just need to copy back and you're done whereas if you go down the route of having you know all the files in a single directory with manifests uh you know you have to read the manifest first before you can restore or you know so the the restoration process gets a little bit more complicated if you try to optimize your storage but uh you know it there the benefits i think always outweigh the uh the downsides here so it's worth thinking about but that's where tooling comes in and so that's that's where uh ESOP, our, our project um, comes in. It's essentially a backup and restore utility for Cassandra. Uh, and it does a bunch of things. So it, it, it takes snapshots for you. So it calls um, uh, essentially the equivalent of no tool snapshot via JMX uh, and you know supports various things like commit log archiving as well. And so it will then upload these files to various remote destinations such as uh, you know, cloud storage, so S3, for example, uh, or even a remote file system. So, you know, maybe you've, <coughs> sorry, uh, mounted an NFS share or something like that on your machine where well, you can you can copy everything over to that. It supports the idea of transfer throttling. So you can sort of say only copy things off node at a particular uh, data throughput rate, um, you know, and there's a couple of pre-canned options as well that you can choose from. It takes a copy of the schema for you. It takes a copy of the token ranges for you. And it does this automatic deduplication of the SS table file. So if the files already exist in the destination, um, 
then it will skip those and uh, kind of essentially it, it, it'll do the equivalent of a touch or something on the other end. So, you know, if you're leveraging uh, S3 with its um, automatic expiry of objects after a period of time, you know, so keep things around for a week or two, uh, we go in and do the equivalent of a touch on the file so that S3 will then push back the expiration date of those files by, you know, a, a day or a week or whatever the, the interval is um, so that only the most recent SS table files will actually hang around in storage for, you know, a period of time. Um, I have a question here in the chat, which is, does it use uh, a native backup format or something custom? Uh, honestly, so the, the data files themselves, the SS tables that are copies, that's just Cassandra's native format. Um, so, you know, there's, there's no custom thing going on there. The only thing that is a little bit more custom um, because we need to support various different uh, remote storage locations that don't all support things like hard links and things is this idea of creating a manifest which is essentially a, uh, I, I think it's a, it used to be just a text file, but we switched over to a, a JSON uh, formatted blob, which essentially for each snapshot gives you a list of all the various data files that you then need to copy back off the cloud storage location into your data directory to restore to that snapshot, which is what the restoration process or, or uh, you know, uh, component of this tool will do automatically. It will go fetch the manifest first, figure out what it needs to download and then restore it. Um, but you know, you could quite easily write a, you know, a custom script or, or tool or something like that to uh, process that file and, and copy the, the files back as well. Um, so uh, this utility um, is, is used in a bunch of different places. Uh, it's essentially it's it's a, a version of um, the kind of internal backup process that we use uh, as part of the managed service. It, it does have a few extra features now of kind of you know things have kind of forked um, you know in, in various directions of course as, as it happens. But essentially the kind of core component of of um, how it handles uploads and throttling and everything like that is is the same as what we run internally. Um, it also, we, we kind of open sourced this. Uh, we were doing a whole bunch of work in the Kubernetes space, uh, you know, working on operators and things, and uh, we're kind of venturing back into that at some point as well. Um, but basically, we needed an option to do backups uh, for, you know, a, a as part of the operator. And so we kind of brought the code out of, of the managed solution. And, you know, there's a few tentacles and things that we had to, uh, you know, a few umbilical cords that we had to cut to, um, uh, you know, to remove all the various integration components and make it a little bit more flexible to use in, in various, you know, non-managed situations. Um, but it's now sort of integrated with these operators for Kubernetes as well. And we also, when, when people are looking for a backup solution for a, uh, you know, on-prem self-managed cluster, we, we point them towards this um, because you know, it works quite well for uh, you know, doing both, as I said, upload to cloud storage, but also if you have a, a internal SAN or something like that that you want to back up to, you can use it to do that as well. <clears throat> uh, oh, so the, the next question, which is, does, does the uh, ESOP tool support <coughs> Authentication, uh, it doesn't need it. Um, essentially, it's doing things at the file system level on the nodes themselves. Um, although, it, come to think about it, I, I think the way that it takes a copy of the uh, schema is that it actually uses CQL to fetch that. So yeah, the, the um, authentication credentials are, are provided. I, I don't know if it, it is compatible with Kerberos or not. I, I'd have to look into that, I'm sorry. I, I don't know the answer, but the majority of it is low level enough that it doesn't need auth. Um, but if, if the cluster does have authentication, then you do need to provide credentials in order for it to be able to take a copy of the schema. Um, or you could just turn that off if, if you uh, felt it was too complicated to figure out how to make that work. But there's some downsides to that, as I said. So, you know, having a copy of the schema at the point in time when you take the, the, um, the snapshot is very, very useful. 
So the the next utility uh, that I want to talk about is uh, another one that we've uh, called Icarus. Um, uh, it was originally just called Cassandra Sidecar, but we wanted to have some slightly nicer names for some of these tools. And so as that name would imply, it is a sidecar for Cassandra. Um, what, what this is for is this all came out of the, the Kubernetes work that we were doing. Um, a lot of stuff done, uh, in the Kubernetes ecosystem is all done in Go. Uh, Go cannot talk to JMX natively and, you know, okay, there's various HTTP uh, kind of adapters for JMX and so on, but we wanted something that was a little bit easier to, um, I, I guess, consume and, and interact with and have something that's a little bit more Cassandra specific and, and knows about some of the smarts of Cassandra. So essentially what this does is exposes a REST API um, to run various operations on a cluster uh, or, or typically at the node level, um, which means you don't have to do this over JMX anymore or you know remote SSH into machines and run node tool commands or something like that. Uh, you can monitor the status of these operations over rest uh, you can create new ones you can you know do a whole bunch of things with them and so what's supported is we actually do backup and restore through this as well so it will actually uh, use esop as a library so you can start a backup over a rest api uh, endpoint um, and the same with with restoring as well uh, but then you can run various other node tool commands such as clean up and decommission and drain and you know all those sort of things as well and watch the, uh, the the stats of those things. So like I said, this is um, you know it's mostly used by the the operator projects uh, at this time, um, but you know there is a little bit of discussion that comes up occasionally on things like the Cassandra mailing list or on the on the Slack channel about sidecars for Cassandra. Um, you know, so th this is one of them. It's it's ours, uh, and you know, it does all the things we need to do. But you know, of course, we're always open to suggestions. Uh, you know, of, of new features to add or, or improvements or, or things that uh, of, of that nature as well. So go check it out. It's up on our GitHub account. So the other big topic that I want to talk about, and and this is something that that kind of you know, it's one of my interest areas uh, is is monitoring and alerting. Um, you know, I essentially kind of was one of the, was one of the first people to write our uh, internal monitoring solution. Um, you know, for the managed service, and you know, there's a whole bunch of challenges that we had to overcome there. You know, dealing with scale and things like that. Um, but over the years, uh, you know, the approaches, of course, have changed, and you know, there's various new ways to to kind of tackle these problems. Um, and with Kubernetes coming around, uh, there's, there's uh, projects like Prometheus, which has become to, uh, started to become quite popular in the monitoring and alerting space. Uh, so it's, it's all about, um, you know, kind of building some, you know, uh, components to, to interop with those, those projects. So just some basics of monitoring with Cassandra. Um, sorry, one second, I'm just gonna. Uh, okay, sorry. Monitoring basics with Cassandra. Um, you know, you could run no tool, and you know, there's various stats options that you can do there. Uh, you know, it's good, I guess, if you're on a node and, and you want a little bit of contextual information about what's going on. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend running these on a you know, periodic basis. I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, so the native option for Cassandra, at least at this time, there's, there's uh, you know, the idea of virtual tables and things in Cassandra 4 to kind of break away from JMX a little bit for, for things like metrics. But at the moment for uh, Cassandra 3.11 anyway, the, uh, the kind of main approach is JMX, which is essentially what no tool is doing under the hood anyway. Um, and then, once you get access to JMX and you start having a look around, you see that there's lots and lots and lots of metrics and it can be a little bit overwhelming. Uh, and there's actually a fair amount of duplication as well. Um, Cassandra does a lot, a lot of aggregation internally. Um, so you get table level metrics, 
Uh, you get key space level metrics, which are essentially aggregates of all the tables, and then you get node level metrics and so on. So, you know, do you collect all that, um, you know, because you're sort of starting to, to duplicate uh, some information uh, when, when you go to store it and, and process it? So some do's and don'ts about monitoring Cassandra. Uh, obviously, highly recommend that you actually collect metrics about your cluster. Uh, it's very useful for just monitoring the health. Um, it's always a little bit worrying where when people, they don't have <laughs> metrics or alerting available. Um, uh, you know, and, and if possible, because the uh, sort of level of information that Cassandra provides in terms of, you know, narrowing down data level sorry, data model problems and things um, is fairly coarse grained in that, you know, it doesn't have a, you know, slow query um, uh, kind of log of every query. Like you can turn on tracing and things like that, but that's expensive. And so there's sort of various things where if you need to kind of narrow down where the problems lie, the metrics are very, very useful for this. And so um, table level, uh, is, is something I'd recommend collecting if you can. Of course, that can be a little bit problematic when you have lots of tables and Cassandra exposes a lot of statistics about these tables. And so before you know it, you could be collecting quite a large amount of information. Um, and we see people also shy away from doing table level metrics because, uh, you know, they, they end up doing things like using node tool uh, or even just raw JMX to collect this stuff. And it turns out it's, it's, it ends up being very expensive and very slow. Um, you know, so don't run node tool on a periodic basis because essentially you're starting up a new JVM each time, uh, which, you know, that's expensive. It's, it's uh, you know, it burns a little bit of CPU time and things. And so if you're doing that quite often, you're potentially impacting the performance of your cluster. And the same goes, unfortunately, for JMX as well. Uh, the, the protocol isn't really optimized for kind of, I, I want to say like, it, it has bulk transport, but Cassandra doesn't use it. So you end up doing, there's a lot of overhead per metric. And so when you want to do lots of metrics, the overheads all add up. And before you know it, JMX is very expensive as well. So, um, you know, in the early days, we sort of knew about, uh, you know, there was problems like if there's too many tables, it can actually take too long to collect all the metrics. So you have to kind of collect tables, uh, you know, at sets at a time, uh, which, you know, has its own sets of problems down the line when you now don't have metrics for every table all the time. It kind of, they come in on a sort of cyclic basis, um, which, you know, is, is not particularly useful. Um, so ideally find ways to avoid JMX and, and definitely avoid spinning up node tool all the time when you want to collect statistics. Node tool's fine if your SSH's onto a node and, and you need to get a little bit of contextual information, but that's, that's pretty much all it's good for. Um, and then of course, once you have metrics in a, uh, in a system, set up alerts, for thresholds and things like that, so that you know you actually know when when something is not quite what you expect. So the project that we've kind of written for this is um, the Cassandra Prometheus exporter, which <clears throat> is well, as the name says on the tin, it it exports metrics from Cassandra, uh, uh, you know, and makes it available uh, for Prometheus to scrape. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail about what Prometheus is in a second, but essentially it's a way of, of uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a plugin or an agent for Cassandra that makes a um, HTTP endpoint available uh, for access and then Prometheus comes along and scrapes metrics from that HTTP endpoint. Um, so what is Prometheus? It's a uh, time series metrics database. It's um, it's fairly popular in the Kubernetes space, but it's seeing more traction in, you know, more traditional uh, environments as well. Um, and essentially it's, you know, it, it stores metrics, but it's also a way to, you know, implement monitoring of your systems. And it has things like alerts and rules and things like that as well. One thing that's nice about it is its data model is actually fairly rich. Uh, you know, it's, um, they call it a multi-dimensional data model. Essentially, you've got metrics 
and metrics have labels. So you've kind of got this, you know, there's more than one dimension of information going on. Um, and then the query language that it has, which they've called PromQL, uh, lets you use that data model in a very nice way. So you can actually do fairly powerful queries over the metrics that you collect. So, you know, you can do things like, uh, you know, aggregate the value from every node or, you know, by table or by key space or something like that, assuming you have the appropriate labels set up um, and then, you know, take those metrics and do something with them, like graph them with, with Grafana or something. Um, you know, so it's, it's quite powerful if the metrics are in Prometheus in a way that leverages that, and we'll get to that in a minute. One thing that it does that, I, I mean, this is probably a little bit of a, like a, you know, debatable, you know, it's a bit of a holy war thing, right? Where uh, is some people really go for push-based uh, metric systems and other people really love pool-based. Uh, so Prometheus is a pool-based system, meaning it goes and connects to the things that it wants to monitor and collects information from them rather than the things that are to be monitored, pushing metrics out on a periodic basis. Um, there's pros and cons to both. Uh, I think one of the, the pros of a pool-based collection mechanism is that the the server can throttle the collection. So if it gets overloaded, it doesn't start having, you know, to do things like throw away metrics. It can just do things like collect on a less frequent basis or something like that. Um, so, um, you know, that, that's one of the advantages. Because the disadvantage is if there's kind of uh, connectivity, uh, things that you need to work around, you know, maybe you don't want a central server being able to connect out to all the nodes or something, you then have to work out ways to kind of, you know, get around uh, security rules and firewall rules and things like that. Um, and, and you can sort of meet somewhere in the middle as well. You can sort of push to a central location and then have Prometheus pull from that. That also works. They actually have a utility there um, called the, uh, oh, I've now promptly forgotten the name of it, but essentially they've got a utility which you can, um, it will scrape from things and then and then store them temporarily uh, for, for a period so that, you know, it's for things like scripts that need to run on a, you know, they're not a long running process. So there's not gonna be a HTTP server running that Prometheus can connect to to grab the metrics. So they essentially write the data to the file system locally or something. And then the, um, the this utility will then essentially serve those files up as a, you know, a very, very simple HTTP uh, service. Um, what's nice about the Prometheus um, stuff is that it's, a, you know, it's all based on a fairly simple uh, text format, um, you know, which does mean that, okay, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's human readable. There's potentially a little bit of verboseness going on, uh, but with things like gzip and stuff like that, it's, uh, it doesn't really have too much overheads in terms of, you know, bandwidth consumption and so on. Prometheus falls under the uh, Cloud Native Compute Foundation, so it's a CCNF project. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, if, if you're in the Kubernetes space, you've most likely heard of Prometheus because it's essentially the de facto standard for doing monitoring in that ecosystem. So uh, the Prometheus exporter, uh, you know, I think some of the benefits is that it is really, really fast, right? I, I was saying before that the problems with doing uh, no tool or even uh, JMX connect, uh, collection is that, you know, you can actually have performance problems and, and that can actually have a detrimental effect on the performance of Cassandra itself. Um, you know, spending all the time doing the metrics collection and the monitoring and there's no time left over to actually service queries, which is kind of defeats the point. Um, and so how we manage to do this is that it runs in process uh, as a JVM agent. Um, so it's essentially able to bypass JMX entirely, um, which that's how it gets its, its speed and its performance. Um, but we've also tried to make it extremely easy to use. You essentially drop the jar into the Cassandra class path and add one uh, entry to the, the launcher script and you're off to the races uh, and you can point Prometheus at it and start getting metrics. So it's nice and simple and easy to use. Um, but if you're in the Prometheus space, you probably go, oh, well, you know, there's, isn't there already existing utilities out there to do this? And well, yes, there is. There's a generic uh, JMX uh, exporter available. Um, and so if you go on onto the Prometheus website and look for Cassandra, you'll see that they point to this. Um, 
but the problem with this is a it uses jmx so it's slow but it's also cassandra uh it, they don't always do um uh, how to put it it uses a standard metrics library underneath but various things are actually exported in a slightly more custom format so things like histograms are a Cassandra specific implementation. And that's this estimated histogram thing, if you're ever interested in to go digging into the source of it all. But basically the generic JMX adapters, they look at that and go, it's not an integer, it's not a floating point. I don't know what to do with it. Uh, I'll just pass, which means you miss out on a whole bunch of useful, potentially juicy information. So a uh, you know Cassandra specific uh, adapter is, is able to uh, you know, read these things and decode them and, and then provide them as metrics to um, to Prometheus. The other thing is, uh, it, you know, if going down sort of a similar line is uh, if uh, you look at various metrics in Cassandra, some of them aren't just standard drop wizard uh, things or even JMX beans altogether. Um, you know, various things like the failure to test the statistics, uh, gossip statistics, those are all done again as kind of custom objects um, that are Cassandra specific. And so the standard exporters just pass right over those. They don't give you any kind of information. And so having more information about, um, you know, your, the, the health of the cluster from things like the failure detector or even gossip is actually quite useful. And so not getting those uh, when using the standard stuff is, uh, is, is a little bit detrimental. Um, the other thing is that, you know, if, if you read about, um, you know, on, on Prometheus's website, they they have a bunch of stuff about how to, uh, you know, how the data model works and the recommended naming schemes for metrics and the right data types and so on and so forth. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff around, you know, best practices for these kind of things. And and because these generic adapters are essentially automatic, they have a set of rules that take a set of M beans and convert them to Prometheus metrics. You end up with a little bit of kind of interesting uh output and you know it's it's either usable in quotes all the way down to complete garbage in in one case so um and you know that makes it very very difficult to work with so um you know if anyone's familiar with prometheus uh, you know that having everything under one metric family with a whole bunch of labels um is not the right way to do it because you can't do things like aggregations and stuff like that. Um, and so one exporter that we were experimenting with, it did this, just put everything in under one metric family. And it essentially, you know, the data is there and you can query it, but it's it, then if you want to do anything useful with it, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, so that, the, the end result is that it's, it's very, very hard to query. So just to give you uh, an example of the, the speed and performance of these things, um, here's a, a benchmark that I did. Um, uh, this is from, from last year actually, but it, essentially it still stands true, where uh, you know this was a kind of worst case scenario of a schema with a thousand tables in it, um, plus all the system uh, tables and key spaces. So, this is usually a you know bad thing anyway because Cassandra doesn't handle schemas of kind of large size, uh, but you know we have seen people do this. And so, oh, you want to monitor your uh, Cassandra cluster and you want to get table level metrics. Uh, how do you do it? Well, if you use JMX, it, you're looking at literally seconds to collect the data, right? So to give you an example, the, this project is also able to run as JMX, partly for benchmarking, but also partly if people don't want to run it as a JVM agent, uh, but you can see the difference it makes, right? So running in process, bypassing JMX, we collect, um, you know, what is that? 174,000 individual time series, which is a lot. So that's without any filtering or whatever else, but that's everything. That's everything that Cassandra provides and it does it in 100 milliseconds. Whereas doing that over JMX and you're actually collecting less, uh, it takes nearly seven seconds. And during that time where we're talking about multiple CPU cores are maxed out at 100% uh, while you know the, the exporter process JVM is doing serialization and 
deserialization and Cassandra's JVM is doing the same thing. So there's a lot of kind of chattiness going on and a lot of overhead to get all this data. And it just gets worse from there. So one, one of the, the projects we tried, it took you know, uh, 26 seconds to collect everything. So you know, good luck collecting metrics on a, on a periodic basis of you know, 20 seconds. If it takes longer than 20 seconds to collect everything, uh, you're just going to be busy all the time and burning uh, CPU time and, and various other things while doing it. So not good. <clears throat> so the advantage of this, right, is, is schema size is no longer really a concern because even if you have a thousand tables, it still only takes a, you know, fractions of a second to collect everything. Um, but we, we spent a lot of time as well uh, making this really nice to work with from a data model um, uh, standpoint. So you get clean metrics out the other end. It's a little bit hand tuned and you get things like nice labels to work with, right? So there's even things that it does a little bit of smarts where, you know, if, you know, under the JMX output, you've essentially things like tables, indexes, and views pretty much all get bundled into one big lump. Um, uh, and so, you know, they're all kind of under one, one group. Uh, what the exporter here will do is it will actually attach an additional label, which is the type of object that we're looking at. Is it an index? Is it a view? Is it a regular table? And so you can start to do things like have Grafana dashboards that are smart, where you can filter on things like, you know, show me only view metrics or only index metrics and things like that. So you don't have to have um, custom built dashboards for your particular schema. You can actually use generic dashboards because they're able to leverage these, these labels and this rich data model out the other end to give you a um, a view of the information in a way that you know you can actually drill down to various levels and and things like that um, various metrics get grouped into the appropriate families uh, Prometheus kind of talks about you know standard um, units of, of measure so you know time should always be in seconds uh, data sizes should always be in bytes and things like that. So we transform the values where appropriate there. And also various things uh, get mapped to the appropriate Prometheus data type. So, um, you know, the M beans that Cassandra exports, some things might be marked as a counter, but they're really a, a, a meter and a meter might actually be a counter just depending on various things. So it might get a bit confusing if you're kind of looking at a value and you're only expecting it to go up but it turns out it also starts to go down. Um, you know, why is it shown as a counter? It should actually be a meter. So here we actually set the, the data type correctly as well, so that when you look at the, uh, the help output uh, attached to each of the metrics, you can actually kind of get an idea about what to expect there. And then lastly, it, it handles all the Cassandra custom stuff as well. So you get the, the histogram data, uh, various timer uh, stuff, um, and then also all the things around, you know, the failure detector and gossip statistics and stuff like that as well. Uh, it, it outputs the Prometheus text format, of course. Uh, that's just how it interrupts with PROM. Um, but there's also a custom JSON output format. If you, you know, want to parse that, it's a little bit easier than the Prometheus text format to, to read. You can just put it through any standard JSON parser, of course. Uh, and it's fairly easy to add additional exporter formats as well. So, you know, it is kind of pluggable. So if, if somebody wanted to make it do something a little bit different, it wouldn't be too much extra work. Uh, and then we leverage a whole bunch of additional stuff, which uh, I won't talk too much into here, but um, trying to uh, kind of optimize this as much as possible. So, you know, it does things to kind of reduce memory usage uh, and, you know, various other things around, you know, overheads are, avoided as well. And it doesn't try and pull in too many external libraries like Jersey, which is you know, Jack's RS or whatever. It just uses Netty because that's what Cassandra is already using to implement a HTTP server. Uh, so we're not kind of pulling in a whole bunch of additional stuff as well. Um, and actually it, it turns out once we've done all this and stuff, the slowest part of the whole thing, once you do some uh, you know, benchmarking is actually converting floating point numbers to ASCII. Uh, as part of the output. So, you know, actually printing, you know, 3.1 bar da 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 is, is the slowest part of the whole whole process, which was essentially quite interesting. In terms of compatibility with Cassandra, uh, it supports 3.11, of course. Uh, we're working on support for version 4 uh, and 
this, this is probably not something that we're you know thinking of doing ourselves but hey um you know why not if somebody wants to provide a pull request for it but support for older versions as well um you know we're, we're really only focused on current and future versions at this point and like I said, the installation is, is super simple. You pretty much drop the uh, the jar into the Cassandra class path on each node and, and modify Cassandra env.sh to start the agent on boot. Um, and then you update your Prometheus config to point it at the Cassandra nodes and you then have some metrics and some data and things. And you can then shove it into Grafana. Uh, of which we do have some pre-built dashboards available as part of the, the GitHub repo. Uh, there's three levels of, of dashboards. So there's a cluster overview, which gives you a per data center kind of availability view and some high level metrics such as, you know, read and write throughput and latency and things like that. But then you can drill down uh, to a uh, node level and then even down to a table level. And by table, I mean things like also views and indexes and materialized views and, and all that sort of stuff as well. Um, so just to, here, here's the cluster overview dashboard. Uh, you see it kind of gives you um, node availability statistics and, and various other things. We've also uh, started work on um, creating some rules for Prometheus's alert manager, which is how you do alerting with Prometheus. Uh, so, you know, essentially you write rules and then uh, alert manager kind of handles things like grouping and, and routing of alerts to, to, to services such as page duty or email or whatever. Um, this, this is still something that we're, uh, you know, working on is, is improving the rules uh, and integration and things, but, you know, watch this space, uh, you know, and of course, always happy to get some, uh, some, uh, you know, feedback or suggestions or even pull requests and things like that on, on the project. So go check it out on our GitHub account. Um, this, this is one of my projects, as you can probably tell, I uh, have a lot to talk about uh, with regards to it. Um, I, I do realize that there's a number of outstanding pull requests. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, the presentation, I have relocated from San Jose back to Canberra, and that was a fairly, uh, you know, long and drawn out and semi-stressful process uh, in addition to, you know, with, with all the other things going on this year. Um, so finding time to work on this uh, amongst other things has been a little bit difficult. Uh, but now that I'm home and, and have a little bit more free time uh, to sort of work on these things and with the idea that I, I now will now be focusing more on, on our open source tooling and things like that, expect to see a little bit more traction on this project uh, going forward as well. Um, so please go check it out on GitHub, um, you know, and always happy to, to hear about people using it or, you know, suggestions or improvements or whatnot. So in summary, uh, we, we talked about a number of the projects here today, our LDAP and Kerberos plugins, which provide enterprise grade authentication, um, the low level diagnostics tools that uh, they look at individual SS table files and provide statistics and various other pieces of uh, fairly juicy and, and useful information. Uh, then ESOP and Icarus, our backup and restore utility and sidecar that complements that. And then lastly, of course, Cassandra Exporter uh, for doing monitoring and alerting with Prometheus. So go check those out on our GitHub account. So uh, just to summarize, uh, InstaCluster, um, you know, we're 100% open source focused. Uh, here, so you know, we only run the open source versions of uh, Cassandra, Spark, Kafka, Elasticsearch, and Redis, um, of, of which those last two we've just recently added support for. Um, so, you know, if you need somebody to help run your uh, Cassandra cluster or Elasticsearch cluster or Redis cluster or something like that, reach out to us. We can do either uh, manage on the public cloud or on-prem as well. So reach out to us for a, you know proof of concepts, demos, things like that. Same goes for all the tools that we've spoke about today as well. If you want uh, some a little bit more hands-on, send me an email and uh, you know happy to happy to give you some uh, you know demonstrations or you know some guidance around using them and things. Um, reach out to Anil. Uh, he's uh, one of one of our kind of uh, heads of consulting. Um, so if, if you do need help with that kind of stuff, reach out to him. 
Uh, and then that's pretty much it. So does anybody have any questions? Um, and if you think of anything after the fact, uh, you know, my email address is there on the screen. It's adam at instacosta.com. Or if you need more general support with your Cassandra cost or whatever, reach out to support at instacosta.com as well. Hey Adam, I, I might just steal the opportunity. Um, we've obviously answered like quite a lot of questions um, en route, which is fantastic. If anybody's got any other questions, post them up in chat. Uh, we'll get to them straight away. But I've just got a question I think you just answered. You just mentioned that um, everything is open source, so you don't release uh, any, you know, any of these plugins uh, that are fe feature limited for the free version versus the commercial version. It's all you make um, everything available to completely free of charge. Is that right? That's right, yeah. So all these tools that I've spoken about today, um, there's no sort of, you know, premium version that's available uh, at, at cost. Um, you know, the, what, what you see on, on the GitHub account is the one that, uh, you know, we, we support and, um, you know, it, it's the version that can be used with the, uh, you know, the open source versions of, of uh, Cassandra as well. Um, so it doesn't need to be DSE or, or something like that. Fantastic.